Recording is in progress. Okay. Cool. So last time I, I uh, talked a little bit about uh, how to teach maths better. So I said we, we send students out to go forth and multiply. Uh, talked a little bit about myself. So there's a quick bit about it, how I am um, a mathematician. I studied maths at the University of St Andrews. I've published two or three books. I've taught, I estimate, around 10,000 hours and had around 1,000 students in uh, 20, 21 years. I've also got another degree in engineering and I'm an engineer in the Royal Air Force. Um, that's a picture of me flying a tornado. So then I've talked about what's the problem with maths? Why doesn't everybody like it? You know, why do we have to push STEM? Why is that even a word? Um, there's an, as I said last time, there's an almost universal dislike of maths. Um, I'm not the first person people call up to invite to a party. <clears throat> um, the pass rate at GCSE is uh, quite low. Um, when I began tutoring, it was about 54%. The 2019 figure there is 59.6%. So that's to get a, a grade C or an old grade C. Um, so that means 40% of the student population don't have a GCSE, which is quite a high, you know, it's almost half. That's quite a high percentage. Um, so what are the problems? Well, that generates 40% of our population who lack mathematical critical thinking skills. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Is that all all right so far? Can you see the yeah, screen? Yeah, fine, thank you. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. Uh, Paul, just, just one thing in, um, uh, pertaining to your introduction there. Uh, yeah. I did I did look on Amazon for um, your books, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, other than audio books, um, there didn't seem to be anything available. So so I don't know whether you're out of print. Thank you. Bye. Uh, no, it's, it should be there. No, yeah. I'll, uh, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, it might be worth you having a look and yeah, just yeah, I'll actually I'll look at it online and show you where, where it is so you can actually see. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So I also talked about um, what are the percentage of people that go on to do uh, A level maths. So we got we got forty percent of people fail GCSE and then of that 60% of passed it and then what percentage of those then go on to do um, A level which is really the kind of gold standard of level that I would like most people to have and it's uh, 94,000 people did it last year that's out yeah. of 70 that's, that is different I really don't but... that's, that's out, out of uh, 720,000 possible students that's about 15% so uh, well, a bit less than 15%. So that's quite a large percentage now. We don't have a, a, a good level of mathematics. So uh, what, did, what did I do about it? I invented a method to make maths easier, intuitive, subliminal, and holistic, enjoyable. Uh, and after 20 years, I've got a pass rate of 96%. Um, of that, of the students I get, they're not the best students you know they're the people who are struggling they come to me and they can't do maths or they can't do sometimes can't do anything i don't get the you know the creme de la creme most of the time because if you're doing well why would you get a tutor so despite that i'm still get a uh, a very high uh, pass rate and even higher in schools who do get the creme de la creme so um that's a bit of a difference um but what i try to leave them with is a feeling of joy because they because they can now do the thing they couldn't do before they claim their uh, self-respect back and hopefully maybe one or two of you felt that last time i think james you said that oh right i can do maths now because i've always struggled with that which was a great feeling hopefully especially was for me um i just put some comments there also um what some students have said to me and how much they've liked it um, quick one on why doesn't school maths work? Well, oh, Paul, so, sorry, before you go any further, uh, we're not seeing your screen. We're seeing you, oh, okay. which is which is very pleasant. But uh... <laughs> oh, okay, that's what we've done wrong here. Let me just get out of this. 
Uh, <clears throat> I'll share the screen. Yes, oh, I'll yeah, share yeah, the screen. <laughs> That's better. All right, can I just point that out? There we go. So I'll start yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, let me just uh, flick through to uh, where we were. So I've talked a bit about myself. Um, got to the point about why doesn't school maths work? So um, <clears throat> uh, let me just uh, show you those pictures again. This is very uh, smooth, isn't it? So yes, there you go. So um, that's me. They're the two books that you might want to get hold of. I'll show you how to find them. And um, that's a picture of me flying a tornado. And uh, these are the figures for uh, maths. The people who take maths, about 700,000 a year, 720,000 take it. Um, but it's only got a 60% pass rate or just below. And then of those, 94,000 to go on to do A-level. So and, and then they don't all pass. So it's quite a small percentage of people have got a high level of maths in this country. <clears throat> And uh, I've got to that point. Why doesn't school maths work? You know, why don't, why don't people like maths? Why is it a subject people want to drop as quickly as possible and um, not talk about at parties? Well, these are the some of the main reasons. Um, some of the definitions that are given are, are misleading. Um, so, for example, the, di the division sign, a bit of a bugbear of mine, <clears throat> is used for a while and then it stops being used. And students are expected to convert to that. It should be one or the other. Um, the given definitions about what brackets mean, which is wrong, they often have a, a, a poor definition of what a prime number is. Um, so I think the definition that's given is wrong is wrong for that. Um, why is minus times minus a plus? The reason for which we do not discuss is the kind of school mantra. Um, and if a student asks why is a minus times a minus a plus, they're told, well, you don't need to know that. Um, so I sort of joke that it's classified information. But if a student asks a question like that, that's great. And they should be encouraged. <clears throat> Next up, um, tedious methods. So the, the met usually the methods don't involve any thinking. They involve just repetitive um, sort of robotic procedure where the student doesn't really know what they're doing, they're just kind of following a, an algorithm. And for, worse than that, you can only use them for one application. So for example, how to multiply two numbers together is only used for that. You can't use it for anything else. Um, there is a greater emphasis on memorization than actually understanding the concepts. It's because there's a test coming up or there's an exam coming up. There's always a test coming up. So. Um, there's always a kind of feeling of time pressure. Well, I've got to, I've got to learn this so I can pass the test. But really, we want to learn this so that we can um, understand it, uh, and that will then make the following maths easier to understand as well. Um, I was once told by a uh, head of department of maths that we haven't got time for the students to understand. Well, that's what a school is, isn't it? Uh, and at the end, I just said there about. Um, class teaching, um, everyone, you've got 30 students who so all learn at their own speed and trying to get them to understand one thing at their own speed, I think is too much of an ask. And that's why it doesn't work. So I've tried to solve this by using easier methods that uh, can be used in more than one place. So that means you need to know fewer methods. You don't need to know one thing for every single concept. You can learn one method and apply it to many different things. Questions that I ask when I'm teaching are um, elicit, elicit uh, their understanding and get the students to come up with the ideas themselves. So you just have to frame the question in a way that makes them um, have to think about it. So one of the first questions I ask is to a student is without using the words multiply or times, what is multiplication? Now, they've never been asked that before. So they actually have to think about what it is. Window, clean, window cleaners. 
So they have to actually think about what what skating is and explain it in their own way. Um, it's not something they've memorized. They have to actually use their uh, creative thinking. So that's an unusual question they've never been asked before. And I ask that first before we do anything. Because if we don't know what multiplication is, it's not a lot of point continuing, because obviously that's what math is based on. Um, I ask unusual questions. For example, when you multiply two numbers, two numbers together, what shape do you get? Is there gravity in space? What is algebra for? Um, questions like that, where they've not really been asked those. So they have to think about them and um, makes them sort of realize they don't understand it as well as they should. Uh, and I've also said that make maths an explanation of discovery rather than just the things to learn and forget the next day. The idea is we're trying to discover the concepts and um, make our lives richer. Okay, so then I put on, that was the first half of the talk and then uh, I demonstrated some techniques. So for today, what I'm going to do is talk about um, how I was inspired to um, create the method and who my inspirations were. So I just thought it might be interesting to be a bit more general than sort of just doing maths for two hours and give you a kind of uh, picture of the different things that inspired me and made me think about how this was possible. Uh, so let's get to that. So this part of the talk is called What One Fool Can Do, Another Can. So here are my inspirations, um, these six people. I don't know if anyone recognizes any of these people. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Does anybody recognize the names or shaking heads? Yeah. Montessori. Montessori, yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. That's funny, isn't it, how I've come across these and often when I talk about them, people haven't heard of them. Richard Feynman is actually a very famous physicist. Um, he's kind of second to Einstein in the world of physicists, but um, still people haven't heard of him. So um, I'm going to talk about each one of these people um, at a time, just to, oh, it's great that you haven't heard of them because now you can learn about them and um, how amazing they were. And they're all, I'll call them all the original thinkers. So they all came up with something outside of, um, the usual standardized thinking. So let's begin with Michelle Thomas. Uh, Michelle Thomas is not his real name. He's actually a Polish <clears throat> guy uh, born in the uh, early 1900s. And I came across him when I was studying my A-levels. I was doing A-level French and uh, struggling badly. Um, I, I didn't get on with it at all. I didn't think what we did at school was a very effective way to learn because I couldn't speak French. So that was the proof <laughs> in the pudding for me. Um, and I was, but I was still keen to learn. I mean, I was very motivated, but I, I couldn't get on with the way I was being taught. And I just happened to catch on uh, BBC television. So this is about 1996, 97, uh, a documentary called The Language Master. And it was about uh, this guy, Michelle Thomas, who would be able to teach you a language from scratch in three to four days. And you'd then be a fluent speaker, which sounds impossible. So they tested him. They got a, 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 uh, a class of students from a, a London school who'd all failed their GCSEs, I think. And uh, he taught them for a week. And you can see in the picture that he created a bit of a different environment. So they're in a kind of darkened room with comfortable chairs um, and they're far more relaxed. You notice how um, it's kind of more relaxing environment than a, a classroom environment. And uh, each day they, they've, <clears throat> he was quite secretive about the method. So they wouldn't let, he wouldn't let cameras in, but you could see parts of it. And at the end of the day, they'd ask students how it went, how it went and, and so on. And they, they um, the head of the school um, was interviewed at the end as well to see if she could tell a difference. 
Well, the main thing is that it was obvious straight away was just how enthusiastic the students were. I mean, they had gone from sort of hating learning to, wow, this is great, I want more. And they were able to express themselves in French, which they, <laughs> um, which was incredible because they couldn't really do anything beforehand. So obviously I sat both up right at this and wondered if I could do it as well, because I had an A-level exam coming up. But um, this guy charged something like $25,000 a week, <clears throat> uh, which is a little bit outside of my uh, price range. A few years later, um, he was convinced to put the course uh, on tape. And as soon as I saw that, I immediately bought it. Um, I still remember it was 60 pounds, which at the time for me, was a lot of money. So I stole my mom's credit card. So that helped. Um, and I bought it and yeah, in a week I could speak French <clears throat> in a nutshell. Now I'd already done French in Italy, but <clears throat> I wouldn't say I was confident and I wouldn't dare go into, in France, I would never speak French even if I was there. But next time I went to France, I spoke French confidently. And the course itself was easy. It was enjoyable, exciting, stimulating. And I still remember it now, 20 years on, I went to France two years ago and I still spoke French fine, but I don't speak French in between. So it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> I went to France, France uh, that October. There were cheap flights for some reason and um, popped over to Spain while I was there. And that's where I discovered I didn't know a word of Spanish. So when I went home, I learned Spanish. That took me about a month using the same course. And then when I went back to Spain uh, that, in Easter the next year, I could speak Spanish. Um, people thought I was Spanish, which was a problem actually, because they'd sort of fire full speed Spanish at me. And I, it was too much because you know, I wasn't that fluent that quickly. But I was able to express myself, say what I wanted, get myself, compared to not being able to ask for the bill, which I couldn't do last time. Now I was confidently saying what I wanted to say. And uh, it was, you know, it was just amazing. It opened up doors. It was just fantastic. When, 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 when English people speak in a, a foreign language, the foreigners love it. So the reception you get is fantastic. What, what was the essentials of his method? He, he, I think in a sentence, it was that he realized that people intuitively learn languages because otherwise they wouldn't speak their own language I mean, how would you speak english or whichever your first language is if you weren't able to, to understand how to learn a language so we used that in the same way to learn a foreign language um the first thing he had to do was take away all the anxiety around it so he for example for french he pointed out that french is comes english comes from french a lot of the words in english are french so he spent a little bit of time explaining that and you realise that a lot of the words that you already know are French. And he points out all the uh, what are called cognates. Well, he doesn't say that word. He never uses technical language like that, but he points them out and gives you confidence. And by the end of CD1, you're saying a whole sentence, um, which was, um, it's not, it's, it, it, might, it might sound a bit robotic, but by the end of the first CD, you're saying, what impression do you have of the political and economic situation in France at the moment? which I still remember now, 20 years later, because all those words, political, situation, economic, um, they're all the same in French. Politique, économique, situation. So he builds your confidence at first by using languages that you, uh, words that you already know. So that's the clever thing about it. Then he shows you the actual grammatical structure of the language so that you can form sentences by just interchanging the words. Uh, so I'd highly recommend it. If you want to learn any of those languages, um, I'll go for it. And that's on Amazon as well. <laughs> I'll, show, I'll, show, I'll, I'll share all the links at the end. Um, now, I was obviously I was impressed by that, but he only did French, Spanish, Italian, and German. <clears throat> and I thought, well, they're great, but to be honest, French, Spanish, they're quite similar to English in that half the words are the same. What would be really impressive is if he did a completely foreign language like Polish, Russian, Chinese. I mean, they're completely alien to English speakers. And in 2008, they uh, did that. 
Let's see, you can see the one on the right there, Mandarin Chinese. And I snapped it up. And uh, I had a time, I had some Chinese friends. And I said to them, how long would it take me to learn Chinese if I wanted to? And they said, well, you need to do three or four hours a day for six months to get anywhere near a proficient level. And I said, OK, well, I'll see you in a month. So I did the course in a month, just driving around in the car. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling. Um, and uh, there was no work, just the CDs. And uh, I invited them around after a month and spoke Chinese to them. And of course, they're blown away. You know, it's a fantastic feeling as well for me because <laughs> I've gone from sort of not knowing something to being able to express myself. And uh, they even said I had a Beijing accent. So I'd never even heard of a word of Chinese before. And then after a month, I could hold a conversation. So um, I, contact, I got in touch with the author to, or the publisher to tell them the story that, you know, how amazing this was. And um, I spoke to the actual author. As we shared, we exchanged emails and then we had a chat over the phone. And because I sort of got myself into this publisher, publisher's world, I also dropped in about how I've got this maths method, which is very similar to Michelle Thomas. And that's how my book was published in the end, because I just emailed them and I just happened to catch the right person. And they were looking for this exact thing, a Michelle Thomas method for maths. And that's what it was. So that was my first, that's why my first book was published. So what I learned from him was what I tell my students today, which I've stolen, which is that if you don't understand anything that I'm teaching you, it's my fault. It's my responsibility. Students often think it's their fault they don't understand and it cripples them. They think, oh, there must be something wrong with me because uh, I don't understand what the teacher's saying. But it's the teacher's job to make sure that you understand that's their role. So that's what I have to tell them at first. And that's what he says. The very first thing he says is the, the, method, the responsibility for learning is with the teacher. And that just removes that anxiety straight away. Um, so that's one of the most important things I learned from him. Okay, uh, next up, Richard Feynman. I'd never heard of him either, <laughs> to start off with. But I was at a friend's house and I was looking at his bookshelf and I found this book. And I don't know why, I just picked it up and had a look at it. And I started reading it in the first few pages and then I, was, I asked my friend, could I borrow it? And I never, I never gave it back to him actually because I read it about 50 times. And the book is about the life of Richard Feynman. And he was a, a physicist. He, he actually worked on the atomic bomb in um, America. And he won the Nobel Prize for physics in 1965. But reading the book, he wouldn't think any of these things because he doesn't talk about it really. He, he does talk about the, the nuclear stuff, but it's not dry stuff. It's about his life and how he started um, from a child um, to uh, a Nobel Prize winner. And it's really just a set of stories, sort of just funny little stories. Um, like it says, adventures of a curious character. And in the stories themselves, they're kind of like little parables about how you should learn or how you should approach things. So one of the earliest stories is, he, uh, it's called He Fixes Radios by Thinking. Um, so it was about how when he was a kid, he didn't have any money, but he had played with radios a little bit and he figured out how to fix them. So he advertised himself and somebody gets a call, can you come around and fix my radio? And this is in the sort of 1920s, so they're quite basic things. And he tells a story about how he couldn't figure out why this radio wasn't working. So he's kind of pacing around thinking about it. And then he sort of went, oh yeah, I figured it out and fixed it. <laughs> and the guy was like, this, guy, this boy fixes radios by thinking. You know, and it was such an alien concept to this man that you could think about a problem to solve it. You know, and that, so that was the point of the story that, um, the power of thinking, I suppose. But in every little story, there's always a little parable like that. And it taught me that I wasn't learning properly. 
I was learning maths or anything I learned just by rote, by memorization. So if I want, because of a test coming up. So, and I had a good memory, which was actually a bad thing because I'd remember it, but I wouldn't really understand it. And if the question was different to um, what I'd seen before, I would struggle, I'd get immediately stuck. But that was the way I was taught. Just remember it, you don't need to know it. Um, and he used to play tricks on his classmates. So he used to sort of demonstrate to them that they didn't, they didn't understand either. And one in particular, I really felt because he, he made a joke about um, something in calculus in the book, quite a basic thing, but I didn't notice. And I made, it made me realize that I didn't understand it either. And I was studying it at university. So that made me it really, uh, the scales really dropped from my eyes that I didn't understand what I was doing. I was just doing procedures and thought I was. Um, so that is another book I'd recommend anyone to read it's really enjoyable read if you look on amazon you'll see it's got very high uh, rating because it's laugh out loud funny um and uh it was very inspirational to me um i got there on the bottom also um a, what's called a fireman diagram that's what he um received the Nobel Prize for. So he worked on something called quantum electrodynamics. And I have the book here. Can you see that? I don't see that. See it now? There it is. This is the actual book I read in 1997. I still got it. And um, at the time, I was struggling with maths a lot. And um, like I said, I, I realized I didn't really understand it. And this guy was a genius. So he talks about how he was keen about maths and he just learned to himself uh, in the book. He didn't, he wasn't really taught it, he kind of just figured it out himself um, through reading books. And in this book, it says in the preface about the book that he used. Now, all it says though, unfortunately for me at the time, was, if I just read it out to you, uh, as a boy, Richard Feynman was inspired to study maths from a book that began what one fool can do, another can. That was it. What one fool can do, another can. That's how it begins. But it didn't say who wrote it and what the book was called. And I was like, I really need to find this book because if I can find that book, I can understand maths like Richard Feynman does. Um, and this is before Google. So I couldn't just Google what one fool can do, another can, which if you do now, you'll find this book. But I couldn't, that was all the information I had. So I went around uh, a lot of libraries at university and opened books and see it to see if the first line was what one fool can do, another can. And one year later, I found it. So <laughs> I found this book here. So it's a book written in 1910 and it's called uh, Calculus Made Easy. And I opened the book up on the first page, what one fool can do, another can. Um, so you can imagine how I felt when I discovered this book. It just says it there. Um, I'll show you a bigger picture of it on the slideshow later. And this this is the next one that inspired me because this book um, explained calculus to me in easy terms. And I'll explain why in a second. One more thing about Feynman. In the book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, he talks about... Um, squaring numbers with um, another scientist, famous one. And he was really impressed that this other scientist could square numbers in his head. He could do 51 squared in his head. He said, oh, the answer is this. And um, uh, Feynman was really impressed with this. And he said, oh, yeah, it's easy to square numbers around 50. This is how you do it, around the number 50. And that was it, that was all it said. Now I'd actually already figured out how to square numbers in my head. And I'm gonna teach you that today. One of the things that I, want, I teach my students is how to square numbers in your head. So I'd, I had surpassed Feynman, my hero. That's the only time and it will all be the only time, but it was a very proud moment for me to realize that I'd done better than he had. Okay, so 
The next inspiration was this guy, Sylvanus uh, P. Thompson. He was a Victorian educator and scientist. Now, you might never have heard of him, but that's probably because he almost discovered radioactivity first. Uh, the person who did was Henri Becquerel. And the reason that Becquerel's known now and not Thompson was because Becquerel published a day before. So he was one day out of discovering, of being the famous person that discovered radioactivity. He also wrote this book, which I talked about, uh, Calculus Made Easy. Now, you're probably not listening to me anymore. You're probably reading the thing on the right. So if you, just <laughs> if you want to read it, uh, the prologue, just take a moment to read the prologue. See that okay? And I'll start talking again in a minute. Okay, so you would imagine that as a, as, as a math student, there are plenty of math books in the math and physics library at my university, and I can guarantee you that not one single one of them started off like this. So this blew my mind. Um, how could a professor say he was stupid? You know, how could uh, he say that everyone else is stupid? <laughs> um, and I, it just sort of chimed with me because that's how I sort of sometimes felt that um, my math professors were sort of demonstrating how clever they were, but not making it easy for the rest of us. And uh, it just blew my mind that a book written in 1910 could start in this way. I don't know how you feel about it. And the what one fool can do another can, that's, the, that's on the very first page. So he, he's doing the same thing. He's taking away the anxiety. He realizes that students feel anxious and he's removing the anxiety by sort of ridiculing the professors a little bit and saying, I'm an, and also um, he's also making himself equal by saying, I'm an idiot. Let me try and demonstrate to you as an idiot what to do. So that again was this kind of removal of anxiety. So that's, that's what I learned from that. And the way that he then explained um, what calculus was, it was so simple that it just, it was like a light bulb moment for me. The, the penny dropped straight away. The first chapter of the book is only one page long. And it just explains two very basic concepts, which are never explained uh, in normal teaching. And it just made me open my eyes and realize what I had been doing for the last couple of years, or two, three, four years. And um, it had a massive effect on my confidence and my grades. So my grades were around about, I always remember that I got one uh, test result was 27%. And then uh, I took another test a few weeks later and I tripled it. And it's because I, I understood it. That was why, and then because I'd read this book. Um, so that was another of, my, another of my inspirations, which you might want to uh, find out about and look up. Next one, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the first name, Jamie uh, Escalante. He was a math teacher in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s, and he worked in a kind of um, city, in a city school sort of thing in LA, a lot of uh, crime in the area, uh, drugs and so on. And um, I don't know if anyone's seen this film, it's called Stand and Deliver, and it's about how this teacher sort of came into a school and he taught students who were uh, not expected to do anything in the, in the academically um, high level calculus. And he, and he got um, a whole uh, class to pass um, college entrance exams, which had never happened before in the school's history. And, um, and the drama of the story was that they they all did so well that they weren't believed. So they had um, they actually had the FBI investigate whether or not they cheated in the exam 
because they've not they've never had anyone pass there in the school before and suddenly a whole class passes so there was an investigation into it they're immediately um, suspicious so they were forced to take, to take the test again and then they all passed it again because they, they didn't cheat so what i learned from that was that it is it's possible for anyone to learn maths um, if you watch the film they've got people who've never heard of the concepts or have any interest in it um, past some high level uh, mathematics because of the way it was taught and that was really inspirational to me alongside everything else I was doing at the same time another one um, Alan Carr I don't know if you've ever heard of Alan Carr he's quite famous-ish in, in England um, but he died about 15 years ago 10-15 years ago uh, of lung cancer, secondary lung cancer, is what he died of. And he, he was a smoker and he wanted to quit and he was desperate to quit smoking, but he could never find a way. Uh, and then one day he realised how to and he just quit just like that straight away. And having discovered this way of quitting, he then, he then sold it and um, started creating a, a clinic where people would come to see him and after a four hour conversation, which all it was, they had quit permanently. Um, as word, this is in the early eighties, as, as word began to spread, it got bigger and bigger and other clinics opened as he trained other people and he wrote books. And the first time I heard of him was on the radio. I was just listening to um, the news on the radio and they said, uh, Alan Carr has been diagnosed with uh, lung cancer and he's got six months to live. And I hadn't ever heard of him. Uh, and he came on to the radio. Uh, they called him up and spoke to him. And he was so happy. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I mean, when someone's got a, um, a six-month prognosis, yeah. you would expect them to be pretty down. But he was really... Uh, he, really he came across on the radio just so happy. His life, he was just such a happy person. And obviously that's stuck in my mind and the next day I happened to be in a bookshop and I came across this book just they just was just lying there and I saw the name so I recognized the name straight away and it was called the easy way to control alcohol at the time I was thinking I was drinking a bit too much so I thought I'll give it a go and see what it says and by by the end of the book I quit drinking um and um uh, and that's been a permanent thing as well. It just takes away your desire uh, to drink. And it was the same thing for smoking. It just takes away your desire to smoke. But he doesn't do it by pointing out how bad it is. He just points out that there aren't any benefits. Um, and it kind of brainwashes you. And what I learned from that was um, it was original thinking again. You know, the problem of quitting smoking or quitting drinking is a massive problem. And yet he, was, he solved it. And he solved it with some unconventional thinking. So that was uh, inspirational to me as well, because that's what I've tried to apply to my method, trying to think about different ways. Uh, and finally, uh, Maria Montessori. She was a, an Italian educator. Um, I think it was around the late 19th century. And, um, and obviously a woman as well. So she disliked the standard education system. She didn't like the kind of classroom rows and um, repetition, and she didn't feel it was effective. So she began her own school where there wasn't a class in it, that everyone was, was on their own project of discovery. And of course, I liked this straight away. This appealed to me when I heard about this. And I wanted my children to go to a school like that. So I went to an open day and of course I asked, okay, if you're not teaching maths in a classroom style, how do students learn maths? You know, it's natural for me to ask that question. And the teacher taught me through it. And one of the things she pointed out was this thing, a thing called a binomial cube, um, which is a thing that a sort of five-year-olds get to play with. And all they do is they, in the, you see in the picture there, there are some um, cuboid shapes in a cube inside a wooden box and they take it out and then put it back again in order. And um, it might seem like a bit of a strange thing to do, but the thing is that it could go in different ways. You have to make sure it fits back in 
perfectly as a cube. And I had never seen this before. And uh, the math teacher didn't, or well, the teacher didn't really understand what it was. But as a, a, someone with a math degree, I did. And it's a 3D, three-dimensional realization of a, what's called a binomial cube, which it, we do in algebra to death. And it's very important, especially in calculus. And I'd never even imagined visualizing this in three dimensions, and I'd never seen it before. And um, I know that it just doesn't, it's just not, just doesn't exist in the sort of maths world to think of this as a 3D thing. But she had, and I just thought this was absolutely amazing. She must have understood maths so well to even think of this. Um, and I still, I stole that as well. I still do use that in my teaching today. Um, <clears throat> in particular, the, I call it uh, the binomial square. So on the top of the wooden box, you can see a square shape and that's called a binomial square. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that later. The uh, binomial cube is, uh, funnily enough, I've got one here. And what that children have to do is take it apart and put it back together. And <clears throat> we, we learn this at A-level. We don't do it, it's not something you touch until you're an A-level student, you can think about until you're an A-level student. So she was teaching five-year-olds intuitively how to understand mathematics that was for 16, 17, 18 year olds and I just thought that was fantastic and um, I was very impressed by that so there we go that's the first half of today's talk has anyone got any questions about anything that I've talked about so far sounds as though I need to go out and buy three or four books three or four books a binomial cube yeah is that published in some way which one is that which which one? No, is there, <clears throat> can I buy a binomial cube? You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're on uh, they're on Amazon actually, but yeah, because Montessori is a worldwide, the schools all over the, the world now. Um, they have their own kind of little internal market, and they need to produce these for the students themselves. So yeah, you can buy one. They're about thirty pounds, quite expensive for what they are, but um, yeah, by all means, get hold of one. Um, I, in sort of pre-COVID times, I give them to my students to put them to do this thing and then demonstrate to them that the algebra that they're doing is the same. Well, we wait to wait to hear more. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, with the obvious success of the methods that you found so helpful. Yeah. Have they been adopted by any educational authority? No. <laughs> be, it, be, it, be it ministerial or local? Oh. No, no. So that's obviously one of the... Um, I think what that's a theme that runs through all these methods. Montessori has taken off, so but it's not a mainstream thing. You send your child to Montessori school outside of the system. It's not part of the mainstream. You won't find it in a mainstream school. Um, there's, still class, there's still rows of tables in, um, well, pretty much in the primary schools. Um, Michelle Thomas method, the language technique uh, that was attempted. Um, I know a guy who he, he was obviously inspired by it. He was a language teacher and he brought it into the school that he worked in and the students did phenomenally well, obviously. And it took off a little bit and even produced a course called Michelle Thomas for Schools. And you could buy a pack and it would give you all the resources. So if you're a language teacher, you could use it. But it's kind of died away. Um, I know that he still does it himself, but no, the, the language learning side of things, I always sort of say that very few people leave school with the ability to speak a language, even though they spent years learning it, um, which is a failing. Well, well, I'm, do I'm doing Spanish at the moment. Oh, great. And I'm going to buy that book. Yeah, I've been all, well, I can guarantee I've been doing it. I've been doing it for six months and I, I'm still struggling. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's a very common experience, you know, and, and, and it's bad because it makes you feel like you're the one who's at fault. But it isn't that, it's, it's the method. So if you, I guarantee you, try the Michelle Thomas method and uh, six months time, you won't be struggling, you'll be confident. Less than that. That's yeah. available on tape or on disc or something as well? Yeah, well, when I got it, when originally, back in the day, it was on tape. Then they upgraded to CDs. And now you can get an app. So um, you can just do it through an app. Uh, so just look on the uh, App Store or whatever. But yeah, whatever you want, really, it's on any of those media. media. Well, well, it was quite interesting that um, you said at one stage, and, and we've just been referring to it, that, it, that uh, if, um, if a student can't um, uh, get to grips with uh, maths or, or any subject, presumably, it's the responsibility of the teacher. And mm. that I might have said something about this um, the last time um, you uh, were talking, but um, it just rang a bell um, with me because um, one of our sons was at York University doing maths mm. uh, and he, he, um, uh, he gave up after the second uh, year because he couldn't get to grips with statistics. Yeah. Uh, and one of, the, one of his problems was that whenever he went to the tutor, the tutor could never explain something in a different way. So it was all, you know, he, he was just stuck in that, uh, in that rut, I suppose, of mm. being uh, told a particular uh, way or maybe even not being told, I, I don't know the, the details, but, you know, the, te the, the, um, the lecturer couldn't, um, uh, couldn't explain it differently. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, just exactly what you were saying, really. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, that, that uh, really uh, strikes a chord. Yeah, hopefully your son doesn't feel that he's to blame. Yeah, it's, not, it's not his fault. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I have a few stories like that myself at university. I, one particular was that I was doing a, a topic called linear algebra and uh, pretty abstract stuff. So I said to my tutor, can you explain to me what this is for? You know, what is the point of linear algebra? And he sort of thought for a moment and said, I can't explain that. I can't explain that without using linear algebra. <laughs> and I thought, that's because you don't understand it. You know, you should be able to say what it is without using the words linear algebra. Yeah. yeah. And that's why the first question I ask my students is, explain what multiplication is without using the words multiply or times. Because you're just using the same word. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So... Yeah, I understand how your son <laughs> felt. <laughs> um, um, yeah, a bit sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's um, it's not bothered him too much in the end. Okay. He's um, um, somewhere fairly high in the civil service, so <laughs> and and deals a lot with statistics. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, it, it could have been a good thing because it, sometimes it is because then you go and use it in the real world, and then it begins to make sense. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you're also motivated to understand it because you didn't before. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, do we want to have a little five minute toilet tea break there? Uh, okay. Set myself up and I'll uh, go through these things. Uh, maybe we won't get through all of them, but um, I'll show you some of it. Well done. Coffee time. Okay. Coffee time. Great Great stuff. Five minutes. And yep. I'll just give me a Bye. shout, everybody. Okay. Can you hear me?